Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Mike Maynard, and I'm going to be your instructor for the day discussing movement joints for masonry, structural addition. I am an, a structural engineer for Force Consulting. We are a team of engineers with uh, a lot of design experience within masonry, and we've been consultants for IMI, the International Masonry Institute, since February of 2010. And we do have a specialty in the structural design of masonry. This presentation is part of a larger series of presentations uh, we've been presenting on behalf of IMI. Uh, and uh, there are many more that you can check out in, as well. All this information is copyright from the International Masonry Institute. All right, today I'm going to talk about uh, several things involving movement joints looking at the types of masonry movement joints that there are, the different characteristics of the materials and systems of the thin masonry. I uh, also talk about the purpose and the location for masonry joints, as well as helping you to acquire some knowledge about how to design in detail with masonry joints in mind. So let's take a look at movement joints for the basics. First off, all buildings are gonna move just inherent in the materials. They're going to shrink or expand or uh, from just from installation, as well as temperature changes from, say, the sun and outdoor exterior uh, weather. So concrete masonry, it tends to shrink as it loses moisture throughout its life. Clay masonry, on the other hand, is the opposite. After it's been drying, dried in the kiln, it then takes on moisture and it tends to expand and grow. So with all this movement, we either need to accommodate for it or restrain it in some way. Looking at movement joints, there are a couple of different labels we can attach to these. Movement joint is just kind of a generic term that we can use for both because it's helping prevent things from moving dif differently and uh, prevent cracking from happening. Or not prevent it, but give it a place to, to occur. The control joints are generally the term for structural concrete masonry and expansion joints are usually used with the structural clay masonry. Most construction today is using masonry cavity walls where you have a structural masonry back up the concrete masonry units, CMU, and a veneer on the front of either clay or uh, stone or many other materials. Uh, one big thing to note is that the expansion joints in the veneer material and the control joints in the backing structural masonry, they don't need to align. Uh, this gives flexibility for um, the connectors, or the flexibility of the connectors for the veneer is what allows for the in-plane movement. The reason we don't need to have them align anymore is that they used to align, but that was when we had uh, composite walls being designed and we don't really design with those anymore. So again, they can be located at different areas as they each have a different purpose. Now the question is, who's responsible for calling out the different types of joints? Uh, well, within the masonry code, the TMS, there is information indicating that the type and location of the movement joints need to be located on the drawings. It's both for the architect and the engineer. The architect generally is going to locate where the control joints, or I'm sorry, where the expansion joints and the veneer are at, and the structural engineer is generally going to locate the control joints on plan as it has a, an effect on the capacity of the masonry involved. And we'll get into that more in a little bit. One big note uh, is that on the structural drawings, we can't just use a single note in the plans to say uh, put control joints at a certain spacing. It's not really enough information for the mason and uh, to be able to put them in the correct place and have them work for the structural design as well as the architectural design of the building. So let's take a first look at the vertical joints. These vertical joints within the veneer, they're needed to help prevent cracking and they're needed when there is differential support uh, say if it's sitting on the foundation versus something else. And rarely would you ever take these out. They want to have these in there to help 
prevent the cracking for aesthetic reasons and everything. Looking at the horizontal joints, they're needed to allow for differential movement. Uh, the purpose is not to relieve. Oftentimes, these get called out as relieving angles to help support them, but that's not really the case. It's more to allow things to move differently from each other to not cause more problems. Uh, in some cases, the horizontal joints can be eliminated, and I'll get into that too a little bit later. The vertical joints, this is where I said that perhaps the veneer is supported by the foundation in one location and adjacent to that, it's actually supported by a shelf angle or another part of the structure. And in which case, that's a great place to have a vertical expansion joint so that it doesn't cause any cracking at that point. We also need to have horizontal joints to allow for movement different from different movement from both the veneer and the backing structure. Uh, the veneer on the outside, like I said earlier, if it's clay, it's going to want to expand and the building behind, whether it's wood, it might shrink. If it's steel, it can deflect all kinds of reasons, but we need to make sure that that's all accounted for so that there aren't any problems occurring. So now taking a look at those same vertical and horizontal joints. First, we looked at the veneer, but now let's look at the structural masonry that's behind everything. Again, it's needed to help prevent cracking. It can also can be used to isolate a structural element. Um, there's certain reasons we want to have something separated by itself or um, to help uh, help out with the design so that the masonry works as intended. And in some cases, we can also eliminate those vertical joints. Now, looking at horizontal joints for the structural masonry, the key there is that never, we never need to do that. Uh, there's really no reason because the masonry can help support itself. It can stack quite high without having any problems. Uh, and so we recommend not ever having horizontal joints in the structural masonry. Uh, here's a detail that we have come across in the past. It, there is a shelf angle supporting the top part of the veneer in this detail, but not the veneer, but the backing structure. And then there's more backing structure down below. And then here's a picture from a job site, and we're not exactly sure what the purpose of this was, but it's definitely not using masonry in the best way possible, and because it can support itself quite well, and there's no need to hang it from the structure as is shown here. So let's take a look at how the details work. Uh, control joints, we're always gonna want to have a bar, a vertical bar with grout in it on each side of that control joint. And you can see that on the left side here with the red line. Same detail, but looking down at a section through the wall, uh, you can also see that we have a bar each side and then uh, sometimes there can be grout fill or other building paper, some things like that. There's multiple different ways to detail this uh, from the architectural standpoint. But looking at structurally, we're gonna wanna have some bond beams go through those joints at some point. Typically there's a bond beam at the top of the wall and at each elevation or at each, the elevation of each floor diaphragm. But we don't want to have those rebar that's going across there cause any problems. So what we recommend to allow for movement in the plane of the wall is uh, having smooth dowels that are either uh, greased, that's an, uh, another option you can have. And this will allow things to move in the plane of the wall a little bit, but tie everything together out of plane of the wall so that uh, things can stay together. And like I said earlier, here's a couple of different details for how the joint is actually made, whether it's building paper, uh, there's always going to be some caulking and backer rod in there. Uh, and sometimes they have sash blocks with a gasket instead. That's another option. So then the big question becomes, how far apart do we need to space these expansion joints? Well, we recommend uh, looking at the source of the Brick Industry Association. They have some technical notes out there. Uh, they recommend having between 20 and 25 feet for a max spacing when you're looking at the brick veneer. Uh, the IMI has a recommendation of around 18 to 25 feet. So we really say that a good rule of thumb is to look at that 20 feet, kind of look at the lower end of it. That way it gives you a little wiggle room, but uh, it doesn't cause too many problems. 
looking at concrete masonry as a veneer, the guideline recommendation is to have the maximum spacing be one and a half times the wall height with uh, exception to not exceed 20 feet. And then looking at the concrete masonry itself for the structure. Uh, same recommendation for the veneer, but at the wall we can extend up to about 25 feet. Again, no, long, no more than one and a half times the wall height. Uh, but when we're looking at a reinforced wall, there are no limitations. And what we mean is a horizontally reinforced wall, and I will explain more of that later, but that will help us to remove some control joints. So let's look at the corners. Uh, for the veneer itself when it's, it's unreinforced masonry. One thing to keep in mind is that a lot of times on projects we see notes that say install expansion joints at 20 feet on center maximum, which can lead to some issues, especially if you start from one corner, say the uh, northwest corner on this plan here, and you go 20 feet to the east and 20 feet to the south, and that meets the requirements. Unfortunately, probably going to end up with a crack at that location. And the reason for that, if you look at this picture here, you can see that the veneer will expand both directions that of that 20 feet and will usually end up pushing themselves apart and you end up with a joint crack there. So kind of as a quick rule of thumb just for veneer uh, that we don't want to have more than 10 feet from each corner and also the two distances on each side of the corner not to expand, not to exceed the maximum spacing that we recommended. So let's take a look now at the structural walls for those corners. Usually we do want to have a joint at the corner and but again you want to have uh, not cause any problems at the bond beams. So you want to again have that smooth dowel that we talked about across that joint so you get some continuity uh, of the structure, but it doesn't cause problems with that control joint. Similarly, uh, we'd like to say have a good detail about the same way at a wall intersection when you have the 90 degree bent dowel, uh, have one side be smooth again or greased, and it'll have the same same result then. It allows it to relieve some. Uh, some of the, not relieve, I, I shouldn't say that, I apologize. Uh, it allows it to have a place to crack if needed, but uh, doesn't cause any problems. And then there's also some alternative options such as uh, proprietary materials for looking at these joints at the wall at the wall intersections. So now let's take a look at the horizontal movement joints, but looking at shelf angles in the veneers and how it can affect the backup structure behind there. So a shelf angle is creating a horizontal movement joint, and it is going to add some cost. There's some functional issues there. You end up with a gap, there's flashing required, some corrosion can happen of the angle itself, you know, thermal transfer, there's all kinds of things. You have to come add special shape bricks. Uh, so one thing to keep in mind, uh, if you're that when you have a uh, structure, you can actually have the masonry extend up at least 30 feet from the foundation. And this is for the veneer, I should say, veneer masonry. Uh, also, if you're framing at a gable wall, you can go up to 38 feet. Uh, and the reason I mentioned this is that then you don't always need to have those shelf angles to support the brick. Uh, sometimes if it's a low rise building, you can get away with none and it just helps keep the cost down as well as aesthetically it looks better that way. Uh, and if it's wood framing behind, if you're above the 30 feet, say if you have a four or five story building, you will need to have something to support that above. Uh, if it's supported by wood framing, then it can only go up 12 feet of veneer at each floor above that. If it's cold form steel or other materials such as masonry and regular steel, you just have to be supporting them at uh, by the uh, non-combustible material. So let's take a look at some options for, for going that 
shelf angle. You can actually run an analysis of the structure. As we mentioned earlier, the wood, it's going to shrink and the veneer, brick veneer wants to expand. So if you take all that into account and look at the differential movement and actually detail for that, then sometimes you don't need that shelf angle. And here's a kind of a view to help demonstrate that. If you look at how much the brick moisture is going to add and grow due to that, and how much the brick might grow due to temperature changes outside, uh, and then it will compress a little bit, so you can subtract out just a little bit there. But then if you uh, look at the structure itself, if it's wood, it's going to shorten uh, a certain amount. And But also if it's other materials, you need to take a look at how much that might move. And if you then look at the differential, total differential, adding those together, the uh, anchor needs to accommodate that movement. So let's take a look at an option or a building that was four story wood structure. And as you can see here, it says there are no shelf angles in this entire building. How did they do that? Well, if you note, look at the bottom right corner, you can see first off they had a concrete foundation come up to the bottom of the windows, which allowed them to get uh, within the height limits, as well as if you do run the analysis, then maybe you don't necessarily need to hit those height limitations. And I'm in the analysis of the differential movement. Let's take a look at the detailing then, as you can see, they accommodated for all that movement. Anytime there is an opening within that masonry, they left the space so that it can move. And then architecturally, you just need to make sure that they take care of that properly. And as you can see, then at the very top of the wall, they leave plenty of room for a movement joint up to the uh, roofing material. So taking a look at uh, the movement joints in the concrete masonry, let's see how that affects the structural capacity. Uh, first off, um, the uh, location affects the design of the wall, both in plane and out of plane. And also can affect the lintel design, how strong that is, or uh, whether you can count on arching action or not. So uh, as well as pilasters and columns, it really, it affects everything in the masonry design. So today, if you take away nothing else, please uh, think about, as they say in the real estate industry, location, location, location. That's really what matters. So let's take a look at just a length of wall. And if you have, that wall split into four sections with control joints. And then you take a look at that same wall, but only break it into three equal sections. Just looking at the lateral capacity of that, the three wall section is going to have 33% more capacity than the four wall segment. And it's all the same amount of masonry there. It's just a matter of where the location of those joints are. So we recommend that you use the longest wall possible without exceeding those crack control length recommendations. Another big effect is on the openings. So where to and where not to place the movement joints? Well, we have some options uh, based on whether we use reinforcement or not. And the reinforcement I'm talking about is actually horizontal reinforcement. Option one is to just have the typical control joints we talked about and using the minimum amount of horizontal reinforcement. Uh, it can be just gauge reinforcement. It doesn't have to be full size bars and those can be into the uh, the joints, the horizontal bed joints where the mortar goes. With this first option, let's take a look at the case where it's an unreinforced masonry wall. In this case, if you have an opening, we want to have that joint be located next to the opening. Uh, so that because that's where the location is most likely to crack. Uh, but then we also add a little bit of horizontal joint reinforcement next to that location, as you can see in both of these pictures. And if the opening gets a little bit wide, then perhaps it makes sense to do the same thing on both sides. The second part of using the minimum horizontal reinforcement with control joints is when we do have a reinforced wall. In this case, we're going to have reinforcement in the, uh, the lintel and the jam 
and basically around that whole opening. And we want to have that rebar extend past a little bit. So that's why we recommend keeping that uh, control joint away from the opening. And uh, many times it's great to, if you have a series of openings, to kind of center those joints between the openings unless the length gets a little too long. And here's a slide showing that very thing we're talking about. In this case, this is what we recommend doing. If you have a bunch of openings, put those joints in between and you can maximize your strength of the structure this way. And I'll uh, talk about that uh, as well a little bit later. Here's another building with similar detailing going on, getting those joints away from the edges of, of those openings. And here's one more still. And these openings are getting to be quite big, but we want to leave room for the rebar to extend past on each side. So we can take advantage of arching action for those lintels, and it helps to maximize the strength of the masonry. Now, the second option we talked about for horizontal reinforcement is to actually add additional horizontal reinforcement rather than just using the minimum. And in this case, then uh, we can add reinforcement so as not to have or to ha actually to remove the number of control joints. In some cases, you can remove them all together. Now, usually use a uh, horizontal reinforcement of about 2% uh, or 0.2% of the area, which is kind of similar to concrete. And there's a table here that shows various spacing of rebar size that can help accomplish this. Uh, but really, uh, there's additional information and with guidance on this slide here that comes from the NCMA tech notes. There's a lot of information available, and we really recommend you go take a look there, which will give you much more direction on how to install and locate these control, uh, control joints and movement joints. And here's an example of a case where we want to have, or not necessarily want to have, but a good candidate for removing the control joints. As you can see, there are a lot of large openings within this wall and they're kind of spaced close together. So it doesn't really give a good spot for any control joints to be located from a structural standpoint. However, if we just get rid of all the joints and have some horizontal reinforcement in there, then we can end up with a very strong durable wall. Now here's a, another example of a fire station, a place where you're gonna have a lot of big openings together. So kind of the conventional framing might be to add some steel lintels and a joint at each opening. And we re really recommend not doing this because you lose all of the continuity of the masonry. Plus the steel lintels, they don't really interact well with the masonry. Generally you end up with cracks anyway, right where that intersection is at. However, with just a few tweaks of the masonry, and a little bit extra of horizontal rebar, then we can change this quite a bit. So let's take a look at this. This is the same uh, elevation opening of those uh, around those fire doors. And if we take a look at here and add some horizontal reinforcement, you can see that on the slide, it's being added in and then adding in some vertical reinforcement at you know each opening, then we end up with a nice grid of reinforcement that is going to allow us to have a nice, sturdy, durable wall, get rid of those joints, and it will be very strong structurally, both from a gravity standpoint, because you have uh, more like a series of lintels that are um, it's a rather than being a simple span, it's a series of spans that are together all tied into one. And you kind of end up laterally with sort of like a moment frame kind of thing. Then what we say is once you get away from an area like this, go back to the regular practice of locating control joints so as not to drive up the cost more than necessary. But this gives a good structural capacity for that wall. And here's another example of that construction in place. All right, so what kind of horizontal reinforcement options do we have? Well, we can put reinforcement in the joints. 
there's common is to have a nine gauge wire. The heaviest you can do is three sixteenths diameter wire, just based on that three eighths uh, thickness of the mortar joint. You can only be half of that per the code. If you want to use rebar, that can be done as well, placing it in the bond beams. And this is actually common in mid to high seismic areas anyway. You're going to need those bond beams so that you can uh, meet the required detailing of the code. Might as well take use of those. And sometimes you can get rid of some uh, joints or reduce the number just to help cut down some costs. That is uh, always a good thing. So the next question then is how much and where do we put that reinforcement? Are we doing an empirical method? Are we looking at an engineered method? Are we looking at joint reinforcement? When you do that, you need to have the bars spaced closer together. But if you use rebar, then they can be spaced further apart. Uh, you have larger spacings, but it's not unlimited. So for this topic, the code is kind of silent. It doesn't really give much direction. But again, our friends at NCMA have done a lot of the legwork to help us out. They have more tech notes that help guide us. So let's take a look at some of the options with playing around with the spacing and size of the rebar. Options A and B on this page show uh, using typical control joint reinforcement, control joints at 25 feet, and using the nine gauge wire. Uh, you can also do a number five bar uh, as well as for option B with the horizontal bond beam, because there's usually going to be one at the top of the wall and at the uh, floor uh, elevation anyway. Looking at options C, D, and E, these have no control joints and they have extra reinforcement looking at heavy heavy uh, joint reinforcement at eight inches on center which is quite a bit it takes a lot to install that you could also look at doing multiple horizontal bond beams or even um, many horizontal bond beams and i'll show some pictures of these these many different options are for the contractors and they're some are going to be better than others it really depends on the project itself and the uh, what the contractor likes to do. So here's option A. This is just your standard uh, reinforcement methods, uh, bond beam to the top, and then your horizontal joint masonry reinforcement. Okay, the option B. Now we're adding that mid height bond beam in there. But we still have the control joints, so we're still just using the minimal amount of rebar. So option C now is turning to removing those control joints. And this is the one where I said it has a horizontal reinforcement in the mortar joint at every course, which gets to be quite a bit. Then maybe it makes sense sometimes to spread that out a little bit and concentrate those at a couple of mid height bond beams. And then you can use a couple of number fives in each. Yet another option is to have more bond beams and just put a single bar in each. Um, again, this just sometimes it's a, a trade off of the costs for construction and installation. Now, looking back at option A again, only this time with openings. This is what this looks like and kind of what we showed in some of those earlier images from the field. And then we can take a look at option D, where there's already going to be reinforcement around each opening top and bottom and both sides uh, kind of makes sense sometimes to maybe just add a horizontal bond beam at those two locations if you have a series of openings and they're all the same height and width then it might make sense to just take use of that if it's already going to be there uh, just extend it out so that it's continuous through and then you can get rid of some of those joints which helps trade off some of the costs and you end up with a really well functioning wall that's going to be strong and durable so looking back at our list of options, the first two are still preferred for common walls just because adding that extra reinforcement can add, add some cost. And this is what the masons are just used to constructing every day anyway. Case D is becoming more popular, especially when you have a lot of openings. 
All right, so now let's take a look. I keep saying that it's going to be stronger for the shear walls. Uh, so if that joint gets away from the openings, it can uh, help things a lot. So let's look at this image here. We have just a single opening. Uh, kind of, you can either have a joint on each side of that opening, and which is on the right, and have two short shear walls. Or on the left side, we have we're just looking at it as one big opening, or I'm sorry, one big wall with an opening in the middle. That, and uh, this is called a perforated shear wall, and that can actually have 300% capacity over those two short walls. And I'll kind of show you how that works here. Um, this is an example from what we saw earlier, looking at having an eight inch block for both designs, 20 foot tall wall, the Single uh, wall, shear wall is going to be 24 foot 8 long with the one 5 foot by 8 foot opening within it. Or you can look at it as being two shorter 8 inch, 8 foot long walls. Those two 8 foot walls, once you run the, the numbers on the design, it's going to have a capacity of 32.6 kips at the top. And it's controlled by the in plane moment of that wall. Whereas if you get those end reinforcement further away from each other, now we have a capacity on the left of 96 kips. So that's about three times the capacity of the other. And this time it's controlled by in-plane shear rather than moment. But we get a whole lot more capacity from the same masonry that's already there. It's just a matter of looking at it slightly differently and locating those joints differently. All right. So Looking at these perforated shear walls, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it's just a shear wall with an opening in it. This is kind of akin to what the uh, people in the wood industry and cold form steel industry have been designing for years. But now with masonry, we have a way to actually design these with software. The software these days is able to do more of a finite element analysis rather than our old hand calcs, which helps make a big difference. So taking a look at these ladder walls, here's a big building that had a whole lot of openings and not leaving much place to put joints. Uh, if you do all these joints, you can end up with too much isolation and no real strength that you can count on from that masonry. However, if you look at from a perforated method, uh, point of view, then those shear walls will be able to take a whole lot more and it's just looking at it with small openings inside. So here's some output for just a single opening on an example. And as you can see here, the uh, output of this graph shows where the points of high stress are going to be at. And then you can just put the reinforcement you need and pinpoint it to just those areas rather than needing to put a whole bunch of reinforcement uh, everywhere. So that's for the lateral analysis and then looking at it from a gravity standpoint, it the finite element takes into account uh, you know, the fact that that lintel is not a, a simple span. It's actually going to be a continuous span that can be have you know uh, fixity at each end and allows you again to use less reinforcement there. So looking at a wall with a bunch of openings, or so here's two different options. The one at the top is just a continuous wall using the, all of the uh, lintels <coughs> continuous uh, and the rebar in there to make kind of a moment frame. And the option at the bottom is a series of small walls that are tied together by the diaphragm. And when I hit this button here, you're gonna be able to see it kind of deflect and it will give an indication of how it's going to perform. Now sometimes it's, it goes fast and it's easy to miss. I'm just going to hit it one more time to sort of show you again. Anyway, this allows us to have a better idea and understanding of what is actually happening with all that masonry. Uh, so like I said, the masonry is there. Let's put it to good use. Okay, one last area to take a look at uh, along the same lines, but this time let's look at those stair cores and elevator cores that are in a you know, mid-rise building. If 
if we have the joints in there at the openings and at the corners, then we end up effectively separating those walls so that it's just looking at it as a single shear wall on each side. And the long walls get um, the load from one direction and the short walls get the load from the other. And it really depends on the orientation as to which way gets more uh, load from it. But then if we get rid of those joints and use just a little bit of horizontal reinforcement, maybe just a little bit extra, and tie this all together and make a big box out of it, uh, then we get essentially like a tube that we can design, which will be able to take more of the stress, and more of the shear. It's not just a shear wall, but now it has tension and compression elements at each end, and this is in both directions. So we have the box type wall has more capacity and you know may already have some of that horizontal reinforcement in it. Uh, so maybe you can just take them out, take out the joints or with just a couple extra bars, uh, then maybe we can eliminate them all together. Uh, and again, we have an example here that shows uh, some numbers with what's going on. Looking at an eight inch wall with an F prime M of 2,500. We've got those door and window openings in there and we'll say it's a four story tall building and each floor is 12 feet tall with 50 kips of lateral load at each floor. So a total of 200. On the right side where it's separated walls, you're going to end up with a moment of 4700 in the side walls. However, if you get rid of those joints and look at the one on the left, those side walls, the uh, overturning moment within them reduces by about half. Uh, and then the um, end walls can take some tension and compression in there and in the flanges. So then you have uh, the load to capacity ratio uh, moving from 1.33 on the right to 0.7 on the left, which can make the difference of that, uh, whether it works or not. And again, it just helps you keep take more strength out of the, uh, or account for more of the strength that's already there with the masonry. All right, so I uh, appreciate you uh, being here with me today and listening to my discussion of these control joints. Uh, and I hope that you've gained a few bits of knowledge from this. I uh, hope you're able to understand what each masonry movement joint type is like and its unique requirements. Also looking from a design standpoint of how to optimize the joint locations. So making sure you're designing with those in mind and specifying those joints on the elevations and plans. Remember those need to be located there by the engineer or the architect so that the masonry mason knows where to install them uh, so as to best take advantage of the material. And finally, there are a lot of resources out there to help with the design of these uh, joint locations and how to know how much rebar to put in to uh, remove them. And uh, anyway, so there's a lot of good information out there. Please take a look at those. Uh, and with that, I uh, that's all I have for today. I appreciate you joining me. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. My email is mike at forceconsulting.com. So if you have any questions about anything I talked about, today or as well as if you'd like to get some of the information that I showed in there, I'd be happy to share that with you. So feel free to reach out. And with that, I thank you and have a good day.